That one. It's fine. Okay. All right. Sure. Um, so just before we get started, we have uh, a presentation about a wonderful opportunity that all of you can take part in at some point. How this turns on. Perfect. Thanks so much. Ooh. Alrighty. Do 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 do. Alrighty. All right. Um, so welcome to week four of Introduction to Sociology. Um, this is our last class before reading week. Um, so uh, I'll have a little slide at the end that I'm sure some of you have seen about reading week. Um, and I have some tips kind of of what I would do uh, during reading week now if I could redo my undergrad and redo Soch 101 as a student. Um, but you should enjoy that time, but try to get a little bit of work done and still kind of try to stay mentally on top of your courses um, so that when you come back the Monday afterwards, uh, you're not kind of spooked by, by learning again. So lifelong learning. OK, um, so today we are, as promised, covering part two of our theoretical two-week journey. So we started last class with classical theories. And now we move on to what are known as contemporary sociological theories. Um, so, oh, sorry, it went, ooh, this, this thing has a life of its own. Um, okay. Good, good, good. All right. All right, so I know we're all excited about the Amazon, but we have to focus on on theory now. Okay, 
So what are contemporary sociological theories? Uh, so you'll notice the textbook discusses how these theories can really be seen as growing out relatively directly of the theories we covered last class. You'll see they all start roughly in 1940, 1950, um, but most of them uh, start after 1960. Um, you'll see Gramsci, the one w they go mostly chronologically, uh, with Gramsci really being in tight dialogue with Marx and conflict theory. Um, but all of the contemporary theories really centered around one core concept that was discussed to a different extent by symbolic interactionists, conflict theorists, and functionalists last week. Um, and that central concept that all of these theories take issue with or, or work with, but do so for different reasons and with different outcomes in mind, um, is the concept of power. Um, so you'll see the word power comes up in all of these theories, and if it doesn't come up directly, um, it, it'll be indirect in discussions of social inequality, ideology, group differences, the naturalization of group differences, and so on. Um, so I can't do justice to all the nuts and bolts of these theories. The, the textbook and the quizzes are designed to help you with that. But what I want you to leave with today, before we get to assignment number one, where you'll actually be applying these things, so I'll make that available to you during the break. I just finalized it today. Um, before we get to the assignment and you putting this in practice, I'd just like to kind of give you um, a snapshot of what each of these is. Um, and so just the slide there, the, just a slight mistake. Um, Marxism there should say, um, I'll, I'll just change it right now. Uh, uh -huh. Western Marxism. Uh -huh. Okay, so, it's all, so you'll see, it's almost the same thing. Um, but Western Marxism, as the textbook explains, is a slight variation of classic Marxism. Um, okay, so the theories we'll cover today in order. Western Marxism, the idea of Gramsci, extending and critiquing some of the central tenets of conflict theory that we saw last, last week. Then we'll move on to feminist theories, uh, which are in dialogue with Marxism, both classic and Western. And the central question of feminist theories is, well, how do we explain you know, the enduring subjugation of women relative men around the world, and particularly in the West? Um, how do you theorize women's experiences? Because that hasn't really been done in sociology um, at, at their time of writing. Um, then post-structuralists or post-structural theory, you'll see the ideas of Foucault. They center on both Marxist and feminist insights about the importance of seeing power as involved in all of our everyday social interactions and seeing ideologies as kinds of discourses, norms, and values that shape our behavior. Um, but post-structuralists and post-structuralism more generally, it's kind of implied in the name, post-structural. So remember we talked about structure and agency. Structure is all that stuff that shapes our lives. It's the institutions around us, the values and all of that. Post-structuralism says, well, maybe we should see those structures a little bit differently. Maybe we should see ourselves as having more agency in our actions, even though we do live in a world that we haven't chosen and we have tons of structures and norms and all of those things. Maybe we need to reframe how we've been seeing them in the past. So yeah, you'll, you'll see what that reframing entails. Um, and then building almost a post-structuralism kind of marks a turning point where you have people focus much more on lived experience uh, and negotiation and challenge and resistance. And then you'll see those themes in three different areas in the final three theories listed on the board of queer theory. So queer both in the sense of meaning um, queer as in gay or homosexual, but also queer in the older sense of the word of strange or deviant or unusual. Um, so the way, the way the word queer used to be used, um, you know, something if there was something fishy going on, someone might say, oh, that, that's, that's queer, why is that happening? Um, so queer theory is queering or making strange. Remember Peter Berger um, making the strange familiar. Queer theory is about kind of strangifying our norms. 
saying, why is it that we've labeled people gay and straight? So it began with sexuality, but then it moved on to all sorts of things. Why is it that we, that we pit success against failure? Um, uh, and, and all sorts of things. So you'll see it's very focused on language. Um, and then lastly, post-colonial and anti-racist theories. Um, so they're, they're very connected. Post-colonial theories we'll see have a lot of relevance in Canada, um, given the fact that we are uh, in a kind of indigenous land which has been colonized by Europeans. Um, and the, this theory uh, asks the question of you know, what lasting impacts do imperialism, uh, the kind of ideologies uh, of, of Western countries, and colonialism, the actual uh, putting into practice uh, of Western practices and Western ideas in native lands, what impact does that have uh, for both settlers and non-settlers? And then lastly, critical race theory. Um, we've discussed ethnicity in post-colonial theory, sexuality, gender, and kind of uh, economic inequality. Um, but sociologists that focus on critical race theory say, well, we really need to see race as at the center um, of all of this. Um, ideas of white and non-white uh, in particular. Um, so you'll see by the end of this, you know, this can seem overwhelming. You think, oh, I've already learned kind of three core schools, and now you're introducing like five or six new theories. Um, again, the course starts very front-loaded, very heavy. You're learning a huge theoretical foundation. Um, but each week, you'll see every chapter we read goes into these theories with more examples. Um, and and they, it doesn't, I can promise, it doesn't just continue forever. Um, learning these, the, these schools now will help you um, in any sociology class going forward. And again, there is a learning curve because there's a lot to know for the first time. I'm still learning about these. Um, so again, theory is alive and it's interesting and it's about helping you see things from multiple perspectives. Um, so you'll see in the assignment, which, which we'll cover today, um, we just want you to get started thinking, you know, if, if someone was approaching a topic using, uh, if someone was approaching a topic, say a social event, a disaster, um, what kind of theories do you think would be useful for explaining that event? Um, so again, we're, we're going to start with you thinking, you know, what are these theories? What kind of use do they have? Um, and then as the course progresses, you can develop more of your own stance, more of your own perspective um, and imagination. Again, everything in this course is meant to be used. Um, all right, so we'll start with Mr. Gramsci. Um, so Gramsci is, uh, again, if you think of kind of historical turning points in the field, Gramsci really straddles the line between classical thought and contemporary thought. Again, he was writing in around roughly the same time period as those early symbolic interactionists. Um, but what really marks him as a contemporary thinker is his simultaneous like, use and acceptance of standard Marxist theory. So remember last class we discussed the idea of the base and the superstructure. Um, the superstructure, again, is all the ideas and norms and institutions in a society except for the base institutions, which were our modes of production. So are we in a capitalist society? Are we in an agrarian society? Marx said the kind of economic relations we have are the first thing we should be looking at because everything else is literally super structural to that or coming out of that or, or based around that. Um, so for, for Marx and for like core Marxists in the early 20th century, um, money and resources were central. Superstructure was secondary. So for people like Gramsci, and he really started this whole, really started what would become post-structuralism, his question was, well, does it really make sense to see the superstructure as secondary? And where this becomes relevant is in that question that we discussed last week of how is it that whoever you imagine the ruling class to be, how is it that these people maintain control of their populations? So that's the central point where Gramsci differed with Marx. And he said, well, I think if you look at how these societies stay the way they are, how the, the proletariat or the working class or the underclass, how they actually stay in that role and rather than revolting, looking, asking that question, asking why they're not revolting, forces you to see 
the control happening in a way different from what Marx assumed. Um, again, so for Marx, all of that control was largely material. Uh, he briefly talked about things like false consciousness that was in the textbook, about how people may come to take the control for granted, but he didn't really flesh that out very much. So Gramsci introduces the, the kind of key concept of, of Western Marxism of hegemony. Uh, so hegemony, uh, in a kind of jargony way, is ideological control of the masses. And so what that means is the ruling class, so again, I, I used some examples last week. If you think of uh, newspaper outlets, television shows, so, so contemporary things, and, and mass media more generally, if you think of these things as being owned by um, the elite class, then in Gramsci's words, you could say, well, everything we learn on TV, so linking to feminist theory, what we, what we learn on TV about who's attractive, um, what kind of jobs we should have, who we should marry, uh, what a good friend looks like, how you should be spending your day. So, you know, TV shows where someone who's like playing video games uh, will be made fun of uh, or, will, or will feel like they're wasting their time um, or isn't having a good job. Things you see on TV and here in the media and around you in society. Gramsci says, well, actually, all of these relatively small, seemingly disconnected things are ways in which the privileged or ruling class can kind of control our lives without us necessarily knowing it. So this puts superstructure at the core, at the core of the analysis. So rather than us all economically being like connected to society, Gramsci says actually there's a lot of small norms and values and ideas that are keeping us enjoying maybe even the lives we're living and not revolting. So to use a, an example close to all of us here, um, a, a kind of hegemonic analysis of the university would say there are so many things you've learned about higher education and careers and what you should be doing at, uh, at whatever stage of the life cycle you're at, you know, most of you, um, you know, late teens, early 20s. There are so many things you've seen in Canadian society about how you should be living your life that you probably are not very likely to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to reject all of that because I see all of this as being controlled by some elite that I don't know, and I'm going to craft a whole new life for myself. So Gramsci says most of what Marxists considered economic domination actually occurred through these more ideological, invisible, everyday practices. Um, and, and domination, so he says there's hegemony and domination, Domination can happen, so people actually being coerced into doing things, but that's much rarer. So again, if you think about your life, you know, unless, unless you've had um, a particularly um, traumatic life, you know, if you've been abused, like, like severely abused by people, controlled, imprisoned, all sorts of things, mo uh, for, the, for the vast majority of Canadians, um, where those, are, those are more the exception, um, being physically dominated by, you know, the state. Um, but everyone living in this society, learning what we should be doing, how we should be acting, we all encounter hegemony on an everyday basis. Again, in terms of our self-presentation, gender performance, all sorts of things, um, what we view as healthy and unhealthy. Um, so again, this idea of hegemony, rather than just resources, uh, marked a huge turning point um, that I think, I think, and I think once you really understand this concept of hegemony, um, the, the other kind of analogous theories that are focused on different things like gender and race and colonialism, um, they all really share this in common of seeing why is it that people buy in to institutions that might actually be um, you know, somewhat bad for them in certain ways. Um, so hegemony again, ideological control and manipulation. That makes, the, the definition of the term makes it sound extremely strong and explicit. Um, but I, again, I think it's useful to think of smaller, more everyday practices. Gramsci himself and his work has been critiqued for making ideology seem perhaps more intense than it is. As we'll see in post-structuralism, um, the, the intensity of ideology, where it's located, how it influences us, 
Um, that has been seen as being more diffuse and more widespread and more everyday um, than kind of just, you know, held within these elite institutions. Um, again, think of your everyday life, think of the ideas that drive you and where they're coming from. Um, so superstructure again, the state, and so he talks about the state and the civil society. So key in Western Marxism is where the economy comes in, so living in a capitalist society, where that comes in in terms of controlling our behavior or maintaining the status quo isn't really always that economic. Um, it's more the system of ideas that have been instituted that make this kind of economy work. So it might sound like the same thing. What does that mean? Um, so nowadays, a lot of people talk about neoliberalism um, and individualism. So neoliberalism, basically, I mean, people will define it differently, but it's essentially the idea that each individual in society is responsible for you know, supporting their own subsistence, and they do so by, you know, earning human capital, getting degrees, getting skilled in something, finding a job, balancing their budgets, and kind of living autonomously. Um, and, and you're liberal. So uh, liberal meaning, you know, you're liberated from the state. You're liberated from the family. You can kind of choose what you want. Um, so many the uh, Gramscians would say uh, many of the norms and values in a capitalist society would then also promote autonomy and individualism and independence. Because if you have a society where everyone wants to be independent, they may be more likely, much more likely, to want to find careers where they can be, uh, be in control of their own life, engage in financial planning so that they don't need the state, and so on and so forth. So again, the, the things that are influencing us, you don't necessarily have to be thinking about money all the time, um, but in my own life, when I felt guilty for playing video games, guilty for dropping out of school, guilty for like not being the kind of person I imagined myself to be, a Gramscian would say, well, that feeling of guilt came from um, the society I was living in largely, promoting the idea that you really are responsible for what you're doing, and if you're not, that's a poor choice you made. Oops. Okay. So now just to see if we are capturing the idea of hegemony. Because as I said, um, Gramsci sees, again, what he calls the ruling class. So you can just imagine elites and wealthy individuals. He sees the way that they control society is in two forms um, of domination sometimes, but also of hegemony, which is different. Um, so just show of hands, so the, the sentence is, Hegemony is perpetuated via the ruling class through force. Um, so show of hands if you think that that is true, through force. Okay. Uh, who thinks that is false? Good, you guys are golden. So does anyone want to explain to me why it's false? Anybody? Oh, right here, perfect. Uh, the whole idea, and this is the thing that's so sinister about hegemony, and we'll see it um, all throughout the course on different empirical topics, um, the whole thing that's either sinister, you know, from the perspective of the person being subordinated, or magical from the person that's doing it, um, the whole thing of hegemony is that the person being subjected to it doesn't realize it. So force is kind of like, no, you all have to go to university um, or, you know, you're going to be like explicitly shamed for not doing it. That may happen to some people, but even thinking of my own life, it wasn't, it wasn't that explicit for me. It was kind of, oh, you know, I, I fell out of school for years, then I had many interactions slowly over time where I just kind of felt judged by people and that I wasn't meeting quotas that other people were meeting. Um, and then that gradually kind of built up into like a turning point for me where then I was like, okay. I, don't, I, I can't really continue down the path I'm on. Um, there was never any moment where I said, oh, you know, there's so much force on me by society. It, it kind of crept up. Um, and I think a lot of times when we feel bad about things in our lives, um, it's more that slow accumulation of realizing that you're deviating away from some norm 
um, and, and that you believe in that norm to an extent. Um, you know, so, and, and if you don't, then good for you, and you can become part of a counterculture to change that. But Gramsci's point is most of the time that's not what happens. Um, and that's why societies and a lot of inequalities maintain themselves um, because people don't always, they don't know what they're fighting against. They don't know what to turn against all the time. Um, okay. Now, so if I'm saying we're living in this world of hegemony and elites and we don't know what to fight against and we feel bad for all these things and bad for all these reasons, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make life seem so, so awful. Um, feminism was a movement where one kind of locus of anguish or pain or inequality really became focused on. And people, and, and women, um, in, mostly in the 20th century, although uh, early forms of feminism have been existing for hundreds of years, Mary Wollstonecraft and, uh, uh, over 200 years ago, um, and all throughout different cultures, there have been women uh, resisting uh, you know, patriarchal subordination. Um, but in this kind of contemporary moment of the early 20th century, a series of women thinkers emerged uh, largely, you know, around when countries in, in the West were getting, where, where women were getting the vote, uh, around 1910, 1920, 1930, depending on the country. And the central focus, rather than the economy, as in Marxism, the central focus of why change was needed and why we needed to realize there were hegemonic forces in play was gender or sexual inequity. Um, you'll see different words depending on, on the article. Um, so just as how Marx was interested in how the proletariat or the property list individuals were kind of uniformly um, dominated and then uh, you know, the subjects of hegemony in a Gramscian sense, Feminists focused on how uh, women were, were controlled by men in societies. Um, again, not necessarily in some complete, absolute way. There are cases uh, of you know, horrible violence against women cases um, and, and, and men being brutal to women, but also in a more subtle sense of societies favoring men's behavior, idolizing masculinity, and downplaying things that are, that are more feminine, you can look at careers, for example, um, you know, things like engineering being more idolized than things like being a kindergarten teacher, um, things that are on the one hand seen as very, very masculine um, or, 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 and mathematical, uh, whereas ones that are seen as more potentially artistic or motherly. Um, so feminists were looking at how these sorts of, so you know, not only the fact that, that women couldn't vote until later on, their wages were lower if they could work, but also how it was that so many things that were feminine came to be devalued in so many different countries. Um, so, so just as how property was seen as so important, why is it that so many male or masculine features were seen as important in different countries? Um, so the, the core concern for, for this, so again, the hegemonic analysis, once you take out the economy, gets very messy and you think, where do I put my focus on? How do I, how do I you know, change things if like, everything has power laid into it? You'll see each of these theories kind of takes one kind of central empirical domain to dissect this. Um, so the central assumption of feminist theory, so we'll see they go through multiple waves. Again, wave one was kind of just like, let's get women the vote and establish them as equal to men. Um, but now you'll see there's been debates between waves two and waves three, and the two kind of focuses, the two points of focus we'll have for that debate um, are a second wave feminist, Dorothy Smith, and a third wave be uh, feminist, uh, Bell Hooks. Um, and you'll see these are, these are different approaches for tackling the same question of why is it that gender inequality exists around the world, more generally, and in particular places. Um, you know, not every single place to the same extent, but why, why is it that, it, that there tends to be um, gen gender inequality? Um, okay, so as I said, the, the textbook doesn't go very much into first wave feminism um, because that's kind of just the first attempt um, at, at consciousness raising and saying, hey, we need to see women as equal to men. Um, so for the last hundred years, um, it, it's really been second wave feminism and, and then third wave feminism in the last 40 years. Uh, so we'll discuss the, uh, those two. Um, so Dorothy Smith wrote, uh, wrote 
you know, in the second half of the 20th century. She's a Canadian sociologist. She was in kind of very similar to C. Wright Mills. She was in dialogue with functionalist thinkers and, like C. Wright Mills, assumed more of a conflict perspective. So remember, C. Wright Mills didn't like people doing grand theorizing or abstract empiricism. Again, when he rode his motorcycle through town, he saw there was a lot of pain and a lot of personalizing of problems. Uh, Dorothy Smith, as a woman, trained as a sociologist, she saw firsthand that, the, that so not only following C. Wright Mills, did sociologists not really tend to make use of all this great theory that they had and all this data, um, you know, they tended to be stuck in the ivory tower. Dorothy Smith, well, the problem's even deeper than this, um, because the whole discipline was what she called androcentric. Um, so this was male-focused. She said, look at all the names we're reading. Look at all the case studies we're using. Um, our studies of occupations, for example, have almost all been on men. Um, our studies of families, even, have taken men's perspectives. Our studies of the economy um, were all written by men uh, and focused on men's experience in the workplace and the labor market. Now, some of this makes some sense, um, given that Western society has historically uh, segregated women out of a lot of spheres. Um, and women weren't in the academy. But Dorothy Smith was saying, we're in a place now where there are women in the academy. And so she actually kind of radically advocated a call for what she called a sociology for women, or a women's sociology. Um, so she said this, this male focus in the discipline was hegemonic. So people didn't necessarily, you know, no one's studying sociology. I'm sure C. Wright Mills would be mortified if someone said to him, you know, you're doing androcentric sociology. Uh, he, th he thought he was helping people, and he thought he was doing, you know, balanced work. Um, but, but that's the thing about things that are hegemonic um, and why you need your sociological imagination. Even in doing your best, you may not realize uh, a voice that you're marginalizing. Um, so Dorothy Smith says, okay, following C. Wright Mills, just as he said, we needed to never get fully stuck in theories, and we needed to actually see, okay, and ask, what is it that we're doing? What social problems are we analyzing? Sorry, just be quiet in the front. Thanks. Um, what, uh, so just as he says, what are the social problems we're analyzing? What are we doing? Um, Dorothy Smith says, well, let's, rather than focusing on uh, this broad macro level, so remember, the functionalists and even the conflict theorists were looking at kind of big system patterns in society. She said, well, as a woman scholar, I know that the everyday realities of women are different than those of men. And many of these power structures that we see um, and that we've been studying from men's perspectives, if we take women as the entry point, again, in that sociology of women doing more ethnographic studies, she pioneered something called institutional ethnography. But if we start from women's experiences, maybe we can build new theories. And again, around this idea of saying personal subjective experience can really inform us about how power operates. So we'll see this becomes very big again. I keep talking about post-structuralism because that's when all of these different critiques really come into full bloom. Um, but here she says, Clearly, women have been cast out of the theories. We now need to start from the perspective of women and see how living in, say, a capitalist society, a patriarchal society, whatever focus you have, how that impacts a woman's experiences. Um, and then start building theories for men the same way, and then ultimately build theories for everyone that way. Um, so again, rather than starting from what we already have, take a step back, regroup, and say, hmm, knowing we have a bias here, Let's try another perspective. Um, so again, just like theories in general, um, realizing you've been looking through one lens and saying, hey, maybe I can come at this another way. Um, so the key concepts, you'll see some of this ruling relations and complex relations. Um, one, of, one of the key focuses, I think, in her work is, again, this notion that, you know, we're living in a society with a, with a huge built-up superstructure, norms and values that shape our behavior. But these norms are not alive, 
in and of themselves. You know, norms are they're, they're innate objects, if they're even objects. I mean, a norm, so, sociologists have all these weird debates about kind of what a norm is ontologically, right? Um, so, you know, for example, in our current society, we have norms about how you act in classrooms, um, you know, eyes to the front, seated, whatever. We have norms in dating um, about, about behavior, norms that are changing, you know, like necessarily um, who pays for the first date, um, you know, on what date people have, you know, intimate relations or whatever. All of these things are norms that change over time. They don't really exist anywhere, but we kind of know them. Um, so Dorothy Smith says, well, a lot of our theorizing of norms has made it seem like they just kind of exist and they're permanent and like they're dominating us. But really, if you think of norms, they only come to life as we use them. So this was central in her own kind of personal journey in the field of sociology. She said, okay, well, sociology may be and very androcentric. It may have taken the perspective of men in all of its history, with a couple of exceptions. But I'm a sociologist, and I can do sociology differently. I can go and interview women, and I can start this sociology for women myself. So what, what that means is, she said, these norms, yes, historically they've had a lot of power, but I have agency. And as someone in the institution, I can start classes that go in this direction. So that's one example of, of a more theoretical claim that we'll see in post-structuralism. Yes, norms govern our behavior to a large extent, but as individuals, we have the capacity to change and override them. Again, why people don't often do that is that these norms have a, hegemon a hegemonic relation with us, and you know, the part of the sociological imagination and, Sills and C. Wright Mill's frustration was that you know, if you don't know a norm is there, if you just think that's how things are, you can't start to doubt it and can't start to act differently. Um, and again, it's, it's, not, it's not always necessarily easy for people to, to operate against a norm. So complex relations and multiple sites, she says, well, okay, it's one thing to say, let's raise women's consciousnesses and the consciousnesses of sociologists. And let's say, okay, things have been sexist, we know men and women are equal, let's just make everything different. She talks about, though, however, again, and this is the, the idea of masculinity and femininity that we'll see on the week on gender, um, many of the norms that exist for one group uh, create negative situations for another group. So an example of this is uh, the, the classic kind of perception of men as being the head of the household and the breadwinner for the family. By establishing men, uh, and you know, there was even a thing in the, in the 20th century called like a family income. So men would be paid more than women or teenagers, like adult men with families, would be paid higher wages than, than teenagers and women because the assumption was they were supporting a family. Um, so this norm about men as being kind of independent, responsible breadwinners cast women kind of just by association as secondary to men in their work, as primary caregivers, um, and as not autonomous, as dependent. Um, so part of the resistance to feminism historically, just like many other social movements, has been, well, if you're increasing women's position, um, then certain men uh, could feel threatened. Um, so we'll see that in, in, with critical race theory as well, that even though it, it's, it's that idea of latent functions, um, that when you change a norm or change your value, people will resist because it might be assumed to take away some of their advantage or some of their privilege. So that's how Smith explains, again, how hegemony works. It may not be through some big ideology, um, but just through everyday practices that give certain people advantages while putting other people in relatively um, disenfranchised situations. And again, she greatly differs from macro sociology because she wants to see how all of these processes play out in kind of unique individuals' lives. So how is it that a woman makes career decisions relative to a man? What norms seem to be impacting her behavior? Um, what kind of interactions is she having with people uh, differently than men? Again, her own uh, experiences 
as uh, a woman sociologist impacted this and resistances she encountered in the field. Okay, so Dorothy Smith is kind of an example of second wave feminism. So just as Marx said we need to take the economy seriously and capitalist society and see this as impacting um, everything superstructural, all of the norms, all of the customs that we have. Um, and then Gramsci said, well, let's look at more the idea component of this and see hegemonic relations. And then feminist theory says, okay, let's look at gender and ideologies uh, that, that keep gender inequality hegemonic in society. Second wave feminism focused on all women as kind of having a shared experience, so shared subordination. Third wave feminism, however, started mostly in black feminist circles, um, so, so black women that were interested in women's rights. They said, well, black women have really been kept out of this conversation. Many of the things that feminists have been arguing for have hegemonically or invisibly actually really been talking about relatively privileged white women. Um, and this is reflected in discussions about black women among, in feminist circles at the time, so 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Um, in these discussions, black women never really fit. Um, Any time black women were discussed, they were usually discussed in the context of, of black men. Um, and, and so it was very difficult for people to think about how, the, how a black woman, for example, could experience uh, racism and sexism in her life. Um, many of the movements, the feminist movements, that heralded um, you know, that all women should be resisting all men, um, many black women were resistant to that because sometimes they felt the black men in their communities had much more in common with them than white women in their communities that the racism they were experiencing uh, created you know, uh, ethnic communities that this, fem this kind of second wave feminist movement, what, what now you might hear on like, the media as white feminism, it's sometimes called that, um, this, this branch of feminism, this women's movement, didn't speak to these women's realities. Um, so Bell Hooks, you'll see her name is in small letters. She did that on purpose. It's, um, it's, she's using, um, the, it's the name of someone in her family. Um, and it's kind of a, a linguistic move because she says she wants her ideas to come before her name and she's kind of challenging like Western notions of authorship and she's about more communal writing and poetry and all sorts of really important things. Um, but she said she, central in this critique was second wave feminism paints broad brush all women as having this same shared experience. Um, but when you actually look at women's lives, you'll see for some people, um, gender is the first thing that impacts their experiences. For others, it's race. For others, it's immigration status. Uh, for others, it could be ability. Um, all of these other things make women a very heterogeneous group, the same way that men and every other group are. Um, so again, third wave feminism challenges some of these older assumptions as being too broad in scope. So. I think Hooks responding to Smith would say, you know, you've opened the door for really great research, but I think we can go even further. You critiqued macro sociology by saying we need to get into the more micro everyday relational element. Now let's really go further. Rather than looking at all women and how they act, look at different classes of women, different groups of women. Um, so you'll see the, the key critique here is, again, not totally rejecting second wave feminism at all, but saying, let's take even more of the assumptions of universality out of this theory and really get more grounded. Um, okay, so just uh, another question. Um, so to see, uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll have a 10 minute break and get to that lovely post-structuralism that I was talking about where it all comes together. Um, what are some similarities and differences between second wave and third wave feminism? Perfect. Oh. Um, so Great point, Doc, and I didn't bring it up, so great, that's why it's good to... 
think about these. Um, another, another key reaction in third wave feminism, so it wasn't just black women's experiences, um, but also uh, men's experiences, non-binary individuals, transgender individuals. A key assumption in second wave feminism was really about biological sex. Um, and again, it was more the, the context of when that emerged. It emerged much earlier, um, before, before all of this, um, before a lot of variation was recognized and, and uh, society became more inclusive. Um, so again, these theories, you'll see, sometimes they cast out a lot of people and can seem very um, non-inclusive, and that's largely to do with the context they were in and who, and who was writing them. Anyone else? Come on, I know reading week's next week, but usually you all participate so much. You've raised my expectations. Yes, okay, good. Thanks. Um, recently, uh, we both looked at um, the women, society, but one of them, uh, only one of them looks at women in general. Uh, but the thing is that, like, uh, black, black, like, race was also another aspect. But the third way that we looked at that, what was like, we did. Yeah. Okay, good. So, I'll stop pestering you this, but it's good just to get this to General theoretical development. So just as how we went from classical to contemporary, you'll notice the trend in theoretical development, and this will be helpful when we get to your assignment, is that theories tend to become more open as, the, as they expand. So, and this is where kind of just historical thinking is important, right? Think of Marx when he was like, oh, society's so unequal, all of these properties, people are exploited. And then think of classic feminists. Oh, society's so unequal. Women are subordinated relative to men. So you start with a very clear, kind of broad claim. Like it's, it's broad in that you're saying, you're talking about a lot of people. So you're saying all, everyone that's not a property owner, then all women, you kind of start with a major claim. And then you become more focused in later on. And then you say, okay, well, I've realized that maybe um, pe different people experience economic impoverishment differently. So I kind of made a very strong claim and now I have to show how that exists. So sub-theories come out. And then the same with gender. You can say, yes, generally that makes sense that women are subordinated relative men, but not all women are exactly the same. And maybe it's not all, just all women, it, maybe then it's feminine identified people. Um, and, so, and so then the theory grows and extends and you have sub-theories. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at the assignment, which I'll make available now during the break, um, just think, hmm, if I'm looking at an issue, does it make sense to see it in terms of a kind of very tight, big, like major claim? Like, is this economic? Is this sex-based or whatever? Or uh, is, it, is it slightly more complicated? And do I need a more nuanced sub-theory to explain this? Um, but th again, those are questions, theorists, debate. Um, okay, so we'll take, we're actually on time for once, um, so uh, we'll, uh, in part due to your quietness, um, but um, we'll take a 10 minute break and then uh, we'll come back into post-structuralism. And I'll make the assignment available right now. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, it's time now anyway. Okay. Okay, everyone, hi. Can you listen to me for a few seconds, please? I really hate to be the party pooper, but I just need to make two quick, like, points. Uh, one thing is whispering doesn't exist in this classroom. It doesn't exist in most lecture halls. If you're at the very back, it doesn't matter how quiet you whisper. The way the lecture halls are designed it sounds like we'll have walking up here. Just a quick reminder, please, no more whispering. It's very distracting up here because it's the loudest up here for Lawrence and I here. And for me, it's not that big of a deal, but for Lawrence, it is a very big deal. Uh, try to talk over you essentially, so please just keep it down. The second is, I know that in like 45 minutes it's going to turn four and we're going to try to be done. Lawrence is going to be trying to be done by then. Last week, like half of you left at four, and it's okay if you need to leave early. Remember, this class is technically scheduled at five. <laughs> but if you do, please do it very quietly. Don't scream up and grab your bags and start crying, rah rah. Just quietly, quickly, because it is very distracting for people who are trying to stay here till the end of the lecture, and it it's distracting for people trying to give the lecture. Okay? Sorry, just two quick points I want to say to you guys. Not that all of you were doing it, I just wanted to say that thank you. Do, do, do.
Oop. Perfect. OK. Um, all right. So now we get into another very special turning point that I've mentioned many times already. But now we get into it so it can be more clear. Um, so Foucault and post-structuralism. So if turning point, well, let's, let's go through all the turning points. So we have functionalism as kind of the first sociological perspective, the first kind of core group of theories. Remember, this is society as an organism. Don't mess with any part of it, because it's like messing with a person. You know, you take out the, the liver for whatever reason, and now the person can't drink, so they go clubbing and they die. Um, you know, that would be awful, traumatizing. So don't do that. Don't shake up the system. That gives rise to conflict theory of people saying, no, like, you know, maybe we really don't want the liver. Maybe, maybe it's causing all these problems. And you, the fact that you're just thinking of these hypothetical latent functions is you actually just wanting to justify the status quo. Um, so we have functionalism and conflict theory. Um, symbolic interactionism comes later. We have Gramsci then coming in and saying, uh, uh, OK, we've been focused too much on the economy and on direct domination and power as really coming in a very crystal clear way. Maybe it happens in a messy or more hegemonic way, maybe in a more invisible way. And then a bunch of domains get studied this way, um, starting with feminism. We see the study of gender this way, the study of the economy, the study of race, all sorts of things. Now, Foucault comes in, so you kind of have Durkheim, Marx, Gramsci, and then you have Foucault here in, in this chronology I'm just creating with the idea of post-structuralism. So all of the theories up to this point, um, and again, again, I said I'm trying to make this as linear as possible, but all of these theories are kind of, it's more like a spider web. So th that's why you'll see some back and forth. Um, but Foucault introduces this idea of post-structuralism. So saying all of the theories we've had so far, um, even the ones like Gramsci that have tried to complicate this even more, they make things see seem very permanent, very top-down, and very relatively direct. Um, but you know, the, the idea of saying that the economy drives our action, or the norms and the values of the ruling class drive the action of, of people that are subordinated, this really strips people of their agency. So we've kind of been focusing on the structure side like almost 100%. So we need to step back and say, OK, well, even if we believe that the structure is very powerful and needs to be changed, whether that structure is patriarchy or capitalism or inequality or whatever it is, or the university, even if we think that that's really, really strong and needs to be changed, let's step back and see how that, those structures are actually sticking around. And the way that they stick around is by people subscribing to them. So that was already introduced by Gramsci. But again, he didn't really go into the micro level of how this happened. Dorothy Smith wrote after Foucault. So that's, she came first in this writing. Um, but, but she was inspired by this line of thought. Um, so, so Foucault kind of broke up hegemony into multiple sites of power, as he would call it, multiple ways in which hegemonic relations maintain themselves. So you'll see power, knowledge, discourses, um, and then discipline, surveillance, normalization. So I'll just kind of try to go through uh, all of these around the major connection of power. Remember I said this week, the central concept that all of these theories deal with is power, but they differ in terms of how it operates. Um, so building off Gramsci that said uh, the ruling class maintains its domination not necessarily through force or violence or outright direct action, but through all these indirect uh, superstructural things like norms and ideas and practices. Foucault says, well, the two main ways that this happens, or the two main areas this happens in, are, are knowledge and discourses. Um, so thinking of the university, for example, ideas that are seen as valid and worth learning, credentials that are seen as worth having and worth money on the job market. These were not, for example, created by an underclass. Um, the, these were created by elites 
hundreds of years ago, you know, that, that, that said these are the kinds of, uh, no, this is the kind of knowledge that's seen as worth learning. Um, so this will become very clear in uh, when we study globalization and more, uh, and, and more writings on colonialism, uh, where indigenous understandings and indigenous knowledge, much like women's knowledge and experiences to Dorothy Smith, were cast out of the academy. Um, so the idea that certain things are worth knowing, that certain disciplines exist in the university, these are not abstract or just natural, but these have to do with kind of battles that happened in the past, ideological battles where certain ideas were seen as worthy or worth more than others. Um, and how this happened was through this concept of discourse. Um, so rather than looking at superstructure as norms and values, Foucault shifts this and introduces this new term that you see Dorothy Smith use of, of discourse. So why, why does having a new word for the same thing matter? Uh, norms and values, as I said, were often seen as just kind of existing in the quote-unquote social structure, as being there, as shaping us. Discourses implied in the term is that they're spoken and they're enacted. So a discourse is a conversation. Um, it, it's, a, it's a framing tool. You know, there are discourses around gender, discourses around age, discourses around work. Um, it, it's, it, but rather than seeing it as some fixed entity, you're seeing it as conversations about gender, conversations about age. Um, and, and this implies that discourses are alive. And that's really the central kind of turning point in sociological thought, uh, where we took you know, some of those early feminist insights, racial scholars' insights like, w, like Dubois, um, and said, hey, these, maybe we can acknowledge the, the kind of causal power of structures and institutions um, and the ability for people to change them if we see them rather than as just stuff existing in society, but as conversations that were had in the past and still shape the conversations we have today. So there's sets of ideas and practices that are floating around in society, and we can literally change the conversation, we can change the discourse um, by, by first realizing that these are post-structural. These, these are not just fixed in institutions, but are just ways of thinking, ways of framing that have been established. So again, thinking of yourself, think of habits that you've learned in your life. Um, they are structural, you kind of run by them, um, but it's to a large extent, you know, if you have uh, certain routines like brushing your teeth and brushing your hair and um, whatever you do on a, daily day, on a daily basis, those you probably don't think about them all the time, um, but if you really wanted to, you could change them. Uh, you know, you might not want to, or, uh, but, but they're yours and you can change them. Uh, so, so that's kind of the shift in structure to discourse. It still might shape you, you know, you still might have to work every day for a reason, um, but you're not like governed to, unless you're being dominated by your employer. I hope none of you are. Um, so, okay, so on that note, Foucault, don't misread post-structuralism as saying, well, we can just change everything all the time, everything's a conversation. That obviously doesn't do justice to people's misery and pain and stratification. So why do these things happen? Again, that question always in all these theories of how do things maintain themselves? Um, you know, how, how is this happening? Um, so this is where I think uh, post-structuralism becomes very useful. And when you think of your own experiences of things that you could change, but you don't. Uh, so, this, so one of the concepts here of discipline. Um, so the, the privileged class, whoever you want to see it, or those that have you know, been more lucky throughout history, uh, they, the societies that we live in are set up in a way that disciplines us from deviating from the norms and rules that have been established. So norms and rules and discourses that worked for one set of people, um, you know, people want to maintain things that have worked for them. They don't want to change things. So in patriarchal societies, that's why things like the gender wage gap still exist and, and norms about women's work being inferior. Because again, if you were to radicalize the nature of work, then a lot of men would get less money and less prestige at their jobs. It's not about any one individual man thinking that, but again, thinking sociologically how and why it is that continues. Um, so power is exercised through discipline. Again, norm violations are 
are uh, rebuked. Um, so again, uh, the idea of, of dropping out of high school, of um, you know, in, in our current focus on like health and wellness, of, of gaining a lot of weight. If you just say, you know, I don't care about uh, my physical appearance anymore. I'm going to uh, behave a certain way. Um, you know, getting a bunch of tattoos, things that are becoming more normalized over time, but have historically been kind of demonized, seen as taboo, seen as other. Um, and, and again, maybe not necessarily through some direct sanction. Um, so no one is telling you, you know, you can, you know, I worked at Krispy Kreme for a year, so I've eaten a lot of donuts in my life. No one told me, you know, don't eat one donut for every 12 that you make, which was kind of my rule that I did actually as a teenager. Um, but, you know, after a while, I, I, I felt guilty when I did that. And I thought, why am I feeling guilty? Um, again, my sister with her eating disorder, that was something I, I had internalized a lot and I've always had this really weird relationship with food. And I think, again, <laughs> again you know, I think too much about this stuff, but I'd say, why am I thinking about this? You know, no one's actually telling me, I mean, no one, I'm a gamer and no one really cares about how I look, yet there's something in my voice that's kind of making me feel not normal, um, not fitting in, whatever. Um, so discipline, it's, it's the idea that, you know, we're, we're living in a world where there's tons of magazines of people that look athletic um, and, and all these fitness regimes and people talking about how much weight they lost. Um, that then, if you go the opposite spectrum, you might say, oh, well, I'm, I'm not living the way other people are. I'm kind of off in, my, in la-la land um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not living how I should. Um, so again, this is by no means me me um, uh, demonizing um, uh, weight or obesity or anything, but just talking about a personal process by which we succumb or live out norms. Um, and again, with me and my sister, that's been something kind of personal. We all have our things. Um, so, dis and I, again, I encourage you to think how these, think of things, you may not think of it as discipline, you may think of it, you know, if you're happier about it, as a value that you have. Um, but think, where is that coming from? Why, why am I, you know, if, you, if you're not getting the grades you want, grades are a form of discipline, um, in that if you don't get the grades you want, then you can't apply to perhaps the programs you want, um, because again, the university has established rules about what kind of students it thinks are good. Um, and, and how do we judge the worth of a student? Oftentimes, unfortunately, it's just by grades. Um, so all of these things work. No, no one's telling you you have to get good grades, but we'll often kind of self-shame if that's where we want to go. Um, and again, related to everything. Um, so discipline, this form of power, works through surveillance. Importantly, and so I use this, the kind of my Krispy Kreme example, of surveillance, just like hegemony, does not have to come from other people. Remember, what we learned in symbolic interactionism is that we are the ones that are making structures powerful and real. We are perceiving our environments. So yes, and I feel very, you know, I'm very sympathetic for people that are actually being surveilled by other people. You know, someone in an abusive relationship, someone with very domineering parents, whatever, whatever the case is, those are real, but that's different from this process generally. Surveillance is often self-enacted. So as we traverse the universe and we live and, and we internalize things, um, we put ourselves on trajectories. We have expectations for what we're doing based on the time and place we're in. People have a tendency, you know, when you feel guilt or shame, you're surveilling your actions using the norms of society. Again, I didn't necessarily have any values about donuts or whatever, but I, I was imagining all of these, all of these things as a, as a you know, 17 year old. Oh, I was so close to your age, I'm sure, already at that time, de aging myself. Um, but, but I know it's hard being a teenager. Um, um, but, but this surveillance, again, could come through, you know, I'm at my job, they're telling me, you have to work this way, you're, you're not being productive enough. Um, but the bulk of the time, individuals are surveilling themselves. Um, and they're surveilling themselves, not necessarily with their own ideas, but ones they've learned. So getting to that question of how does this inequality manifest? Well, with the example of gender, um, people surveilling how they look, people feeling they're not sexually attractive, people feeling they aren't wearing the right clothes. Um, with uh, intelligence, again, feeling you're not coming across as intelligent as society has defined it. 
uh, with emotional skills, feeling that you're socially awkward. There's all these memes about you know, the socially awkward penguin and stuff. Um, people always think of these things. That we're, we're constantly scrutinizing ourselves. Um, so Foucault uses the term normalization as, as really uh, kind of getting the death knell of this, of saying, well, we've normalized this self-surveillance. Um, and, and so and, uh, these practices and ways of living, uh, we, we just think some of them are so routine and take it for granted, again, that you'll act a certain way in the classroom, you'll act a certain way with your loved ones, that if you don't, you almost should be surveilled and punished. Um, again, I don't think most people think that in any, in any direct way, uh, but you know, if you see someone talking particularly loudly on the subway, um, or staring someone down. I often like to think of the more funny ones, like if, like if you just stare at someone for too long on the elevator or something, um, they, they might get kind of freaked out. Uh, so, and, and because they're just like, well, that's, that's not normal. And if you keep doing that, I don't know your motives. Um, but, but anyway, the point is, for, for all of this, to think, uh, I don't want to fray you in too many directions, um, but theories that were more macro-focused tended to see these structures as having much more direct impacts. But once you bring in the kind of active, alive person, the subject, into the equation, you see that a lot of the power of the stuff around us is actually coming from ourselves. And again, where this theory can get really complicated in is Foucault is the last person to do something like victim blaming. This isn't saying that people are creating their own problems. It's not saying that at all. What it's saying, though, is it is fascinating how people, as a group, we come to feel that these norms and discourses around us are permanent uh, when they were actually made by other people and are changeable um, and are like infiltrating our thought patterns. Um, and, so, and so the question for all of these people is, given that our minds are so complex, given that we debate things all the time, why do these norms so often feel like straitjackets on our behavior? Um, because, you know, again, we could be doing all sorts of different things. Why is there this homogeneity happening so often? Again, very turning point uh, in, in the fields of social thought more generally, of seeing the person as much more central uh, to the theory than what Durkheim and Marx and others would put it. Um, okay, so question time. Um, so what would be an example of how surveillance, so the idea, remember, I defined it in my own kind of unusual way, um, but acts of observing, recording, training, again, at a personal or, or separate level, uh, what would be an example of how surveillance can be used to discipline or motivate someone to produce particular realities, which is a weird way of saying just um, kind of get someone to do what you want? Great. Exactly, Sarah, the disciplinary. She surveils during the class and then finds like pockets of discipline. Um, the way that you can like surveil the people like this one people would be like um, a school bell would be used to like make people more comfortable and um, yeah. Um, so in my own personal life, this is kind of funny, this is kind of the opposite that I think it should be, but in high school I remember um, when my parents would be on me about my grades, my, like my grades tended to be lower, but I told them, like, guys, if you just relax a little bit, I promise I'll be fine. And last year when they did it, like, I got like, good grades, and I think that's funny because it's like the opposite, I think, of what they expect. Like, if they're on me, then I should be good, getting better grades. I just, I don't know, it's kind of the pressure. I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So you work kind of better without the surveillance. Yeah. Uh, I think this point, uh, I think this a very common and irrational mind. Let's say like thought. And it's a very like natural response. But suddenly everyone around you like you like some kind of social variety. Excuse you, like why would you do that? But it's perfect. Right? 
make a match. It is. Yeah, you can do the, the sociology of gasping and the farting. And there actually is a paper. There's actually a, uh, there was an academic study on farting uh, and why it's such a taboo thing because it's more. Ugh. Everyone wants to do it, but you're doing it. Why are you doing that? You're like signaling that you don't care. So it's some weird, you know, there's a lot of things like that. Of it's, it's again, the, you'll see, I always, uh, I was telling a student in the break, I always like to revisit Cooley's concept of the looking glass self, that we, so much of our identity is based on the cues we get from other people. Um, so the reason we're mortified to do a lot of things, like, like release toxic gas, um, is, is that we think, oh, other people will think all these things about us. Um, we don't know what that is. Are they going to think I'm gross or I don't care or like I'm also someone that yells, all the associations with it. Um, but really, when you're thinking about it, why, why does it have all of those associations? It doesn't have to. Oh, I think uh, in the front. You won't be disciplined for that. Um, okay. Oh, one more. Yeah, so exactly. That's central. So the idea that you can be disciplined by somebody else, and then you internalize that, and you don't view it as discipline, necessarily. You think, you know, oh, I was taught to have regimented meals, and then now, on my own, I find I tend to be hungry around the times that I was disciplined to eat before. Um, so, you know, discipline and nourish instead of discipline and punish. Okay. Yeah. Emotional reactions are also places. So, if someone does something that actually angers you and you get angry, that's kind of pushed down uh, on because you're not supposed to get angry and you're supposed to turn the other cheek while totally normal get angry. And people will tell you that uh, you shouldn't get angry and you should be really kind towards it even if it angers you. So that sort of thing. Yeah, people's emotions are very much surveilled. Um, again, I think it's interesting to, to think of why, and people end up feeling very stifled because of that. Okay, there's one more in the front for a little, ooh, the microphone went haywire. So for example, uh, people often say, if you don't think that's the most you should do this, you should do this, you should do that, but it's really discouraging in a way, but you're also getting encouraged you don't want to like that, so I think that, that, that Yeah, again, it's, um, you know, there are so many, there are so many examples. I think we can come up with um, the intention, you know, the, again, I don't want to think, make people think that they're parents and a lot of kind of, you know, guardian type individuals in their lives, teachers, we're, we're disciplining them to make them normative subjects, as Foucault would call them. Um, I think a lot of the time people are just trying to help and they think, okay, well, we're living in a society where many sorts of behaviors are just not accepted, like farting in public and staring people down in the elevator. And so if I train my children, if I discipline them to not do that, discipline my students not to do that, um, you know, in a class like this, discipline people not to send like aggressive emails or whatever, not, not that that's happened yet. Um, but you know, if you get a response you don't like, um, those are things that are designed to help, right? So, um, but they also have the unintended consequence that Foucault would say of reproducing the very structures that they maybe have problems with. Um, so, you know, I don't necessarily think um, students have to be super formal with professors all the time. Um, again, I'm very open about how I'm not even a professor. I'm a grad student that's been professing for two years. Um, but at the same time, I know you'll go in other classes where the structure may be different. You may have someone much more serious. And so if you're very informal with me, um, then you, know, you may be punished by somebody else. Um, so this idea of now, so now we have the kind of core trajectory. 
uh, of social thought, I think, that we'll see in this class. Again, it's a very front-heavy course, lots of theory and stuff in the beginning, and then it will become kind of narrowed as things progress. Uh, so moving on from post-structuralism. So now we've seen we live in this world, structures and institutions and norms, but they only take on the power that they do as we use them. So now we branch out into theories which really focus on changing these sorts of structures. Now that we know they do impact us, but we can change them, and they don't have to impact us the way that we think they do. So queer theory is um, a, a, a theory in the name, as I said, largely based, it was based on the gay rights movement, but also to do with deviance more generally. So queer in both sense of the words. Queer as, as gay and queer as um, strange, depending on, on the word. Again, I'm not saying that gay is strange, um, but they're, they're different. Queer has double meanings. Um, so there's three main areas that queer theorists have focused on. And again, the distinction is important because queer theory moves beyond just sexuality. Again, you can queer things by making, them, making the familiar strange. Um, and, and that's what queer individuals often are uh, to themselves, because as, as a group, um, you know, we are not having the same sexuality as, as heterosexual individuals. Our sexuality is othered. It's different. Um, so queers already do that. Okay, so the three main areas that queer theory focuses on. Desire, language, and identity. And questioning the idea of sameness. So again, thinking of feminist theory, uh, early first and second wave of men being treated the same as women, much like third wave feminism, the questions were, well, is that really what we want? Do they have to be the same or can they be kind of separate and equal? So queer theory, desire. Um, so uh, the, the idea that certain kinds, again, starting, it's just easy to anchor it with, with sexuality first. Um, the idea that certain forms of sexuality are privileged and others are not. So you'll see many queer theorists problematize ideas of monogamy, um, ideas of two partner relationships, ideas of marriage. Um, so key in the gay rights movement uh, originally was that gay individuals could get marriage, um, which is a great thing and was legalized recently. Um, but many gay individuals also think, hey, well, do we have to necessarily go after the same kind of customs and form of life uh, as what's worked for straight individuals historically? Um, is the only way we can have equity being the same? Or can we have different desires? Uh, related to this, uh, I remember the first couple weeks of the course, especially week one and two, I said so much of our thinking is trapped in binaries. So things that are right or wrong, uh, white or black, um, queer theory says language is this, this binaristic view of good or bad, straight or gay. All of these things are so deep in our language, um, and we need to open them up. Uh, so part of, again, uh, the, you know, the, the LGBT expanding, uh, the acronym expanding, accepting more identities, um, things like non-binary, two-spirited. All of this is saying the straight gay dichotomy just like the male-female dichotomy, the successful-unsuccessful dichotomy, anything you think of that often you know, we use to surveil ourselves, these, if we queer them, if we think of them as strange, uh, if we're more intersectional, as one student brought up with third-wave feminism, we could see that all of these categories uh, are actually much messier than, than we've made them seem to be. Um, and then identity. So building on the idea that there can be multiple forms of desire, uh, so in terms of sexuality, again, it doesn't just have to be straight or gay or married or not. There can be all sorts of different variations. Uh, with language, again, moving away from binaries, then to identity, seeing that rather than just being you know, who you are from birth to death, our identities are rooted uh, socially, so socially produced, meaning our goals, um, again, our, our ideas of masculine and feminine, of success, of failure, of progress, of being a good person, being a moral person, not caring about morals, being religious, all these sorts of things. These are a product of where we are, but we're also doing it, and that means we can always change these things. 
So again, key in queer theory, so two things. Yes, it's one that started around sexuality and gay rights, but it's also about fulfilling that kind of classic sociological insight of making familiar things very strange. Um, so again, the double meaning, the double meaning of queer. Okay, um, post-colonial theory. So again, making the familiar strange in a different way. So Edward Said, um, oh, it's the next slide, I'll get to it. Um, but so we'll get to Edward Said, who's kind of a, a key thinker on post-colonialism and specifically West versus East depictions, uh, what's called Orientalism. Um, so post-colonial theory. Now colonialism, again, we are in a land that was colonized by European individuals. Um, you know, in, in Canada, uh, in what's known as Canada, it's called a settler colony because indigenous populations, uh, through many brutal pro practices, uh, were, were marginali marginalized and kind of relegated to the fringes uh, through processes of incorporation, um, but some that were, of course, very violent and uh, violent against uh, the practices that were already present. Um, so imperialism is this idea that the practices, all the superstructures that a group has, um, so you can go back to that superstructure pyramid, um, but, colon but imperialism is, is, the, is the act of saying, you know, we're going to bring all of our superstructure to a different society. And we're going to colonize that society around that superstructure. So that's a jargony way of saying, in the context of Canada and America, groups of Europeans uh, forcibly, remember Gramsci said, dom said um, power can be either domination and force or it can be ideological. So colonizers through force um, in enforced their, their practices onto, the, onto these lands. Um, again, the, the changing of the names of the country, changings of the practices, uh, putting uh, indigenous individuals in residential schools, all of those things to make what was a different country, a native country, to make that a colony of the European country where people were coming from. Um, so post, you'll see it's the second post. So we had post-structuralism, what's post-colonialism? Well, and this is something that's debatable, so you'll see there's a question. We won't, this is more just a thought piece, because I don't think we've learned enough about this in this class to really have a full-on discussion, um, unless anyone has an idea right away. Um, but post, in the name post-colonialism, suggests that the process of colonialism formally ended um, decades ago. It may still be ongoing if you look at the way indigenous knowledges are often uh, sent to the fringes, not, not respected. Um, you know, there are movements to have indigenous and aboriginal studies in universities. Most universities have programs that are geared towards uh, those understandings. Um, but the fact that they're making relatively slow progress uh, begs the question of, has post-colonialism, so an era after colonialism, really been recognized, um, really been realized? So why is that a question? Um, so Edward Said was key in this movement of, of looking at post-colonialism and saying, just because we're in an area and in, in a time span after colonialism and colonialism has formally ended, just as how we're, we're seeing the world post-structurally, it doesn't mean that colonialism is dead, just like structure is not dead. So in post-structuralism, we have more agency than in pure structuralism. We're seeing the stuff around us as being more a conversation, more a discourse. In post-colonialism, it's the same idea. We're still dealing with the colonial re residue quite strongly, um, but there is more negotiation to change it and reframe it. Um, so how, did, how does, what's one kind of empirical thing you can study to look at the impacts of colonialism? Um, so Edward Said, was a scholar of the East and the Middle East. Um, and he looked at this, he created this concept of Orientalism. Um, so you might remember an example I used in lecture one of kind of how the West has often been framed um, as endorsing a more individualistic ethos. Uh, so again, that individuals in the West are responsible largely for themselves, they're highly autonomous, they want to be independent. 
whereas individuals in the East have, also, have often been framed as collectivist or more group-focused, more conformist. Um, so this dichotomy I used on purpose to, to kind of sensitize you to this, um, this is a framing that has traditionally been used to make Eastern countries seem inferior to Western countries. Um, again, what the West is seen as more creative, more industrious. Um, the East is often, like, quote unquote, lagging behind. Um, even when you look at the theories of Marx and Weber and the way they studied, quote unquote, Asiatic societies, this was kind of a running theme. Um, and, and, you know, when I brought up the work of Ibn Khaldun, who was um, a, a scholar of the Orient, um, he, uh, uh, he, his work uh, was part of, part of what Said would say, his work was not seen uh, as relevant, and people looked at the work of Western scholars like Comte and Durkheim um, under this same assumption, that the East was just not as, uh, it wasn't up to par. Um, so Said talks about three kinds of Orientalism that you can kind of look at empirically. He wrote this famous book in the 60s, Orientalism. Um, so the first is academic Orientalism. So this is when academics would uh, actually study Asian countries like Japan and China. Those were two that were frequently studied. Uh, and they would go and they would do things like ethnographies that we'll see next week in the, in the, or in two weeks after the break in the methods week, um, where academics and supposed government experts would go in and catalog those societies. And again, oftentimes they would come up with findings that the practices and beliefs of those societies were kind of archaic or not as good as Western values. Imaginative Orientalism. So this is more, again, uh, many, uh, many uh, stereotypical depictions of, um, of Asian individuals and Asian countries and media and poems. Um, all of this, you know, kind of the idea of, of Asian countries as being exotic, um, relative uh, Western countries. And then institutional Orientalism. Um, so these were actual Orient, these were actual institutions that were designed to maintain control over what were called Oriental countries or now Asian countries. Um, so certain kind of branches of the government uh, where these countries could be monitored. Um, so Canada and colonialism, I've already in interspersed that uh, in the discussion of post-colonial theory. So, uh, so it's, it's not too much on this. I think that's why, I think this was the module that also didn't have a quiz, if I'm right. Um, so this is, this is because, again, it's very, and thanks for those that let you know, 3.6 didn't have a quiz. Um, that's because it is very, it's, it's part of uh, post-colonial theory. Um, so Canada, again, has its own colonial past, like any settler colonial country. That's what you would call a country that has been colonized. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a research piece that's discussed in this part of the chapter um, by Park, and she looks at how uh, Canada's past practices with Asian immigration have created, uh, she, she gives quotes of police officers saying that uh, people, you know, maybe, maybe, the, the, maybe the way they're interacting with uh, Asian girls has to do with the fact that people think Asians are more submissive. Um, so that's, that's a common kind of cultural trope um, that Asian women are submissive relative white Western women. That's something that Park, Park's research says even the police seem to, uh, to think. So again, these ideas of, of active and passive um, collectivist and, in, and individualist, these are rooted, according to people like Said, in colonial projects that were trying to, in colonial individuals that were trying to justify uh, what they did to these individuals. Um, so saying that you came into a country and you took over the customs and, and put people in residential schools, if you could convince people that what you did was actually uh, boosting their culture, giving them better norms, better values, making them smarter, making them um, more contemporary, um, then that was a way to ideologically justify something that could be quite brutal. So again, in Canada, just this will link right to critical race theory, the context is um, think of the history and the legacy of things like residential schools and the way things like that have been justified historically. And even think of you know, this, the recent efforts to get rid of certain statues um, and, st and stop publicizing certain historical figures because of their involvement in colonial practices. 
So again, showing agency, there's, we're in a time of a lot of social change and a lot of pushback against these discourses. So again, things need to change, but there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Um, okay, so lastly, the last school of these theories, I know I'm throwing so many theories, but once you have this toolkit, then every other week, You'll, you'll have all these nice lenses, you know, you can sit in a room with like 10 pairs of sunglasses and just take them and you can label them the different theories and take them on, put them off. I don't know, maybe that's what I imagine myself doing. But um, you, can, you can think, you have all these theories. All right, so the last one, anti-racist theories. Um, so critical race theory is the core of what's called anti-racist theories. So just as feminist theory said, okay, we're getting all caught up in this discussion of hegemony. We need to actually focus on one real thing that needs to change, and this is the subordination of women. Critical race theory says, well, if we learn from feminism, and we learned from colonialism, that power is at the center, and oftentimes, you know, that's men dominating women, and racial majorities dominating racial minorities, uh, through hegemony or through force and violence. Critical race theory that started in America which, as discussed, is a country that was founded largely on slavery um, of African Americans. Critical race theory and American theory, born out of American feminism, says we need to see race relations and racial inequality as central to American life and to any country where racism, you can make, a, make an argument for, is historical and structural. So again, we've been focusing a lot on post and seeing agency and seeing how we can make change. Critical race theory says that's great, but we also have to see how, just how structural um, many of these things are. So again, these theories, they ebb and flow in terms of structure and agency. Um, so like the, like the, the post theories, so post-structuralism and post-colonialism, uh, critical race theory still emphasizes the micro component. Um, so bell hooks, Again, as she argued, we need to look at individual black women and how they experience society. We can't just lump black women with women or with black men because they have issues with both of those groups, just as how everyone has issues with everything. But they're, they're a unique group, and we need to, we need to see uh, what makes them unique, what structures are impacting their behavior, and how they can resist, and whether they want to resist. Um, so... Critical race theory values drawing on personal experience because, again, many of the experiences of marginalized individuals have been kind of kept out of the canon and kept out of the academy. And so it's inherently intersectional. Um, but, but, but its focus on structure comes in through its emphasis on what's called historical racism. So again, things like slavery, the enactment of racist laws and codes, that these are things that individuals have to deal with, regardless of what they think about them. So if you were living as a, like uh, Du Bois at, as, a black, as a black man in the time of slavery, as much as you may want to you know, reinterpret the structure around you, if you were to go in certain neighborhoods, you would be killed. Um, you'd be lynched. If, uh, so, so that is you know, emphasizing the, the significance of structure. Uh, for, for certain individuals. Um, so then lastly, where does this, so the, and the other implication. So the last, and I think the chapter ends on this theory for, for good reason, um, of, of just kind of, uh, it's part of anti-racist theories, using that sociological imagination and saying, okay, all of these theories have tended to focus on those that were subordinated or are subordinated, those that are disempowered or disenfranchised by structures. What if we start to look at people that are getting privilege from these structures? So theorizing whiteness is this idea of saying, how is it that, you know, when you have the term, uh, like, like the term racialized or race, how is it that white has kind of always slipped through? Um, so look at the binary construction of race again. Oftentimes, individuals in the West are framed as either being white or non-white. Um, even look at the categories on, on like censuses that you have visible minority. Um, and again, white, white has been established, according to the textbook and thinkers like Dyer, as kind of the default. 
So just as Dorothy Smith argued how men were often cast in androcentric theory, um, kind of just how things were theorized before, men were cast as the default. Um, in, in critical race theorists and anti-racist theories say, how and why is it that white has kind of been seen as the default race? Um, and, and how, again, if we're thinking of media messages that people learn, uh, stereotypes, things like exotic, um, all, all these terms, how is it that these don't really apply uh, to white individuals as well? Why is, why is that more difficult? Um, if, you, if you were to see a TV show um, that had all Asian or black individuals on it, why is it that that would more likely be framed as kind of an Asian or a black show, whereas a show that had all, all white people on it you wouldn't be called a white show. Um, nowadays, I think people are more sensitive to that, but if you look through American TV over the last 30 years, um, you know, you, you would kind of notice that. Um, so, again, all of these theories are little boxes. I won't go over them here, but this is just notes for you to have, and they're in the t from the textbook. Um, but all of these theories share strongly in common an emphasis on seeing power as part of everyday life. And some see that power as more kind of inside structures. Others see it more as inside us. Others, some are more focused, like more, more general about what they're studying. So the economy or the nature of hegemony. Um, then others are more focused on looking at uh, women's experiences, then the experience of gays, then the experience of ethnic minorities. But all of these different iterations of theories they all really stem, as the textbook says nicely, um, from conflict theory. They all draw on uh, those criticisms of functionalism that I mentioned before. Uh, that, you know, thinking that things have evolved because they're, adaption, they're adaptive, thinking that they're working for everyone. If you take a more micro approach and you look at how people are experiencing the world around them, you'll often see there's so much conflict over things. Um, and when there isn't conflict, it's often because there's hegemony, that people, you know, they just start to accept their lot in life. So going all the way back to C. Wright Mills, um, what these thinkers are trying to do is make sure that people don't personalize problems that may be social. So remember, personal problems are often social issues. So again, people, Dorothy Smith, people experiencing sexism, Edward Said, people being orientalized, He's, all these thinkers are trying to see, okay, the problems you're experiencing are actually historical and social, and how can we look at them more effectively? Um, and so just some questions to think about going forward, because we're, we're running low on time, um, but think again, what, what is Smith's sociology for women? What are the forms of Orientalism? Um, what are the concepts that are key in post-structuralism? Um, again, power, discourse, and how when looking at Canada, can you see Orientalism and colonialism? Um, so just things to think through. Okay, so assignment one, before we go. So we have tutorials again this week, so again, please um, make sure you check the syllabus. And again, I'm getting lots of little technical emails, which again, in terms of being kind at the beginning, I've been answering a lot of technical emails, but Going forward, I might, you might just get that kind of snappy professorial email of, please see syllabus. But I, I, I don't want to do that because it's the beginning of the year and I know you're all overwhelmed. But everything, really, really, most things are in the syllabus. Um, okay, so if we go, I'll go to the student view to make sure everyone has it and to hide my secrets. Okay, so I'll go modules. Ooh. Okay, that's not where you see it. Assignments. Okay, assignment one. Submit here for Monday section. Come up. Um, Ta-da. Okay, good. So it's there. Magic, right? Slow, slow, painful magic. Okay. Um, okay. So you have a nicer copy of this, and then the rubric uh, you can see on the other page. Okay. So assignment number one is available on Quercus. You can see the rubric there. And I have stuff up here too, um, and I'll, I'll get all that sorted out soon. Okay, so in this, so the, your tutorials, so again, so I debated, I want, I want you to have this before the break, obviously, so you have three weeks to work on this. Um, this is due October 22nd um, at 6 p.m. on the dot. 
on Quercus. I'll show you the week before how to submit it online. I'll show you briefly today. Um, in case, you know, those of you that really want to do it over reading week, you can do it. Um, this is where 10% of the final grade. As you'll see, it's about 1,000 to 1,500 words. Don't be intimidated by the word count. Um, you'll see I broke it up into sections. So it's, 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 quite, it's actually quite short. Um, I know you probably think I'm scamming you. But, but you'll, when you actually start writing it, you'll say, oh, I wish I had more space. I just, my ideas, they're flowing out of my mind. I don't know how to stop. But you have to stop. So, anyway, so 1,000 to 1,500 words. You'll see it's part of that discipline and surveillance, meeting our guidelines, which are largely based on TA grading hours. But um, they can't, we'd love to write, read your manifestos. Um, but, but that's, anyway, I won't get into the politics of that. But um, so, what I want you to do so, in tutorial one, I know you already talked about some current events and issues. Um, I, again, I encourage everyone to be very personal, or as personal as they want to be in this course. Um, think, find an issue in the news that you think, um, A, is interesting and important, however you define that yourself. You have to describe it in the, in the text. But a meaningful event um, can be positive or negative, disaster or something great. Um, find a current event that has to do with inequality, um, so again, inequality, it can be a form of inequality that you think needs to be changed. It can be a form of inequality that you think is making strides towards progress or equality. The, the angle of it, it's up to you. Um, but find a current event broadly having to do with inequality. Um, and then what I want you to do, so the core of it is, I want you to pick one classical theory, um, so functionalism, conflict theory, or symbolic interactionism and explain that event through the lens of that theory. So again, those 10 pairs of sunglasses, you put on your little functionalist sunglasses, and you say, I think th they'd explain it this way, and th it would come out of this. Then you put on a contemporary, a more contemporary pair of sunglasses. And so you look at feminist theory, critical race theory, post-colonial theory, or queer theory. Again, depending both on what you're interested in, theoretically, and in terms of suitability to the topic. So you say, let's say I'm looking at like, gender pay gaps and why women make less money. And first, I'm going to look at conflict theory and say that like conflict between men and women, um, historically. Then I'm going to look at feminist theory. Like those would be two, that those would be kind of natural fits. Um, and then say, um, you know, feminist theory extends this by looking at Blah, 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 all this stuff Dorothy Smith says. So you pick your issue. You then explain it how the theories and the theorists within those theories would explain it. And then you make an argument of your own. So which of those theories do you think is more compelling? Um, so I'll just go to that before I get to all the little technical things that I have to cover. Um, so again. These, this word count, which can seem so daunting, you'll see it's broken up. So introduction, concisely, intro, I won't go over all of this, but so you'll see introductions. You introduce your event. You then explain the event. You then explain how, class, how your classical theory applies to your event. You then explain how your contemporary theory and why. So it's not enough just to say it applies because of blah, blah, blah. You say, why is this important to consider? Why does this apply? So remember, my lectures can be useful. It can be useful to rewatch the lectures, because here I talk a lot about, uh, I tell students, the textbook gives you kind of much more, they give you definitions and examples. I try to tell you the significance and kind of how these theories react to one another. And they change the way people frame questions. So those are addressing more the why questions. Um, so why would it explain an event that way? Um, and then the biggest section of the paper is your argument. So 400 to 500 words. A logical argument about which of the two theories you think best helps explain this issue and why that's your position. So again, almost any topic can be explained using almost any theory. These theories are all quite broad. But it's up to you, as the budding sociologist that you are, to say, I think theory B is more relevant to this topic because it explains da 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 in this way more efficiently than this other theory, or it makes you see this one event that the other theory said didn't really matter. Um, and so you see I'm saying the word I think because you're, it's fine to use the word I, 
Um, you shouldn't use it like in every sentence or anything, but when you're developing the argument, again, all of this is in the tip sheet um, that's part of the assignment, but these papers are your ideas. Um, and I know different high schools teach different things, but in academic writing, uh, in sociology anyway, saying I is completely fine. I will argue this. It is my belief that this is what, it, what X is. Um, I still write that way for academic papers in my dissertation. That's totally fine. Um, and then a conclusion. Okay, so important things before you go. So again, this is a pretty exhaustive document. Um, as much as I'm happy to take certain emails sometimes, um, our lead TA, his big, his, the core of his job is extensions and then academic integrity that we'll see. So if you have reasons for why you have to be late, that's okay. Um, but make sure you ask Jason, the lead TA. Um, he does all of that. So if you email me, again, not being rude, but just volume, I'll just forward it to him. He makes the decisions. So in terms of autonomy and dignity and all those things I talked about, um, there, it's his duties, not mine. Um, so late essays that are unexcused. So you can still hand your papers in late, um, but they're worth 60 points and you'll lose five points per day. So pretty significant if you're late. So I would recommend emailing him well ahead of time and telling him your situation if you're gonna be late and he'll either kind of yay or nay it or he'll tell you what you need to bring him. For depending on the excuse, um, like whether he finds it legitimate or not, uh, it might just be fine and you can have a weak extension. For others, he might want documentation. Um, sorry, I mean the reason, not the excuse. Saying things that are making things sound worse than they are. Um, so academic integrity and citation. So I'll go over this in more depth closer to the deadline because I know you all want to enjoy reading week and have fun and all that and not get bogged down in this. Um, so I'll, but please review this. You'll see I, I made something else available on Blackboard, um, a little academic integrity quiz um, that'll, that you can get an extra point on the assignment. So it's out of 60, but you can, you'll get an extra point if you do the quiz that I put online for you. Um, one thing I changed in this course, so this was the lovely, fa fantastic t Professor Kathy Little's course, and I kept a lot of the things similar. Um, one thing I changed uh, was that they'll be going over in tutorials, uh, hopefully this week, is academic integrity penalties. So no coincidence that I uh, have this on the week on on d discipline and surveillance. Um, I don't like having to do this, but again, I'm trying to teach all of you how to write in an in a appropriate way so you don't get horrible academic sanctions down the road. So what I've done in conjunction with the dean's office is I've come up with a system of penalties. Again, I'm making it sound more malicious than it is. Um, but this, what I've done is, uh, in the past, I, a lot of students were sent to the dean's office, um, you know, given marks on their records and stuff. Um, and so now everything's being handled inside this course. So you won't, you know, unless you completely just buy a paper uh, or plagiarize complete paragraphs, um, we'll be dealing with it and you'll lose marks. Um, so it's very basic in terms of what you can't do. So you'll see the sheet. Um, each assignment will have a different penalty structure. That's the whole one. You just have to make sure you don't do these things. So you'll see some of them are extreme. Um, so parts of the assignment written by others. Um, so we have plagiarism detection software. If we see that um, you know, it shows an editor wrote your paper or it completely matches someone else's, that's unacceptable. You'll get a zero for the assignment. Um, the assignment was previously submitted for credit for another course. So on our depository, if we see that it was someone else's essay or something you used um, somewhere else in another course, that's zero. So I'm just going from the most extreme to the minimal. Um, if you don't use in-text citations, so you'll learn what those are when you do the quiz, um, but uh, if you directly use the words of someone else, um, including even me, in, like in a lecture, so if, if, I, you know, if I say three sentences and then you just put those three sentences in your essay as is, uh, you need to put direct quotes around that and say that that was written by the person or said by the person that wrote it or said it. Um, and then there are more minor ones, so leaving out uh, references that you used in the reference list and 
uh, missing quotes when using direct quotes. So maybe you actually directly use the words of someone else, but you made it look like you were paraphrasing. That's often an accident. So like you, you use a direct quote, you put the, the year, but you don't put the quotes. So it made it look like you paraphrase it and it's more of your idea than it is. So the penalties are based on the severity of the problems. And again, this is not designed to punish you, but to prevent you from doing it in the future. And it takes a long time to learn this, um, so the penalties get higher with each assignment. Um, but these are extremely easy to avoid. Um, you just have to, to self-surveil to make sure you don't do them. Um, so I have some, oh, so question. Oh, you, well, you need to know who the author is for the site or you can't use it. Well, like if you're finding from the website that we don't have authors, then you can't use it. No. It has to be it has to be a source you can identify. Um, so for assignment one, you'll only really be using the textbook anyway. Um, so you'll see here just an example. I have examples of what you want to cite. So example quote. As an academic discipline, sociology is dedicated to exposing you to a new and unique way of seeing our social world. Um, you'll see that the textbook, obviously, for those that are using Revel, it doesn't have page numbers. And I contacted Pearson about this, because I'm like, how am I going to teach my students not to plagiarize when I can't even have them cite properly because there's no page numbers? And I was really angry. I could show you all the emails. Because I said, I wouldn't have bought this textbook because I'm teaching poor practices. But I looked online, and, and there's a way around it. So, and also the textbook, it shows 2019 when it's obviously, well, it's, it's, we're in the future. So anyway, so the textbook, it's, the copyright's 2019, so whatever. It'll make more psychological sense next year, I guess. They're, they're ahead of the game. Um, but so if I'm directly quoting something on a page, again, this isn't that complicated. Students often get really scared by citing. It's, it's quite mechanical. If you're citing something directly, you put quotes, and then you put the names, and you put module one afterwards. So that's just, as I'm reading it, I see, OK, this student isn't telling me that they came up with this idea. They're using this idea of someone else, and I know where I can find it. I can go to the textbook and type module one. I go to the reference list, and I see Ravelli and, and Weber. You know, the ASA list online will show you how to write that. I can locate the textbook. I can see that you're not lying to me. Again, people aren't going to do that, but it, it's, you know, honor system sort of thing. Um, then here, if you're writing, I just have here um, the introductions and summaries. They obviously don't have module numbers, so you would do the same thing, and you would just write Ravelli and Weber 2019 Chapter 1 Introduction. Yep? If we're citing something that you've said, uh, how would you like us to do that? Like from the lecture? Yeah, so um, citing from the lecture, you can just write um, Williams 2018 colon Lecture 4. Lecture three. So the same system. Again, we're not super, super tight on this. It's more just we, you have to be consistent. Um, and so you'll see in, in, the, in the ASA guidelines too, they have things for movies, for lectures, for all sorts of sources. The key is that your reader, again, you have to assume a kind of hostile reader that thinks you're like conniving. And, and, you, and say, OK, no, I ha I ha or like a better way of framing that, think you're like a lawyer making a case, and you have your evidence in front of you, um, and you're not just making stuff up. So you can point to the source, and they can go to the page, and they can verify what you've said. It's all very scientific. Yep. Can you say this, like, yeah, so I'll make sure, um, and I'll make an announcement about that. Um, and, and the uh, TA leaders will let you know in tutorial. Um, this, the American Sociological Association has its own way of citing. Um, and, and it looks like this for direct quotes. So it's, it's last name, colon, page, um, or sorry, last name, year, colon, page, um, or last name, year, if you're not direct quoting. Um, again, it's, it's, it's a system, so it takes a while to learn. Um, but it is quite, it's, the ASA one's quite simple. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very simple in terms of what you need. Um, and then again, like in all, oh sorry, and then in, in all assignments, you have to submit the academic integrity checklist. So it's saying, it's kind of, as I said, there's, it's a kind of, it's a little surveillance tool that the university has, has con constructed, um, which is just to make sure, again, honor system, that we can't always track everything, but for your own intellectual development, that you are um, going to be academically honest. 
Um, and again, I know it can seem kind of silly in the context of discipline and, and surveillance and all of this, um, but it, it's very important. I know sometimes these writing exercises can be overwhelming, um, but please just, like the worst thing you can do, and if it's happened, again, I've been in this university on the teaching side for like seven years, the worst thing you can do is commit an academic offense. Um, again, in this course, it won't be like taken to the dean or whatever, but you could get a zero, and there's no reason to do that. Just do the assignment. If you're having a lot of issues with it, contact your TA, and we'll help you. And go to the writing center and talk to me. Um, there, there's a lot of supports here, so please just don't go to one of those like essay buying services, because oftentimes they just, they're total plagiarized cases. People see that, um, and that's just, that's not good to do. Yep. Sorry? Are we able to get feedback for the mission? Oh, um, so the feedback, just because as I said about the There will be community feedback. So great question. So everything in this course, um, unfortunately because of the size and that we only have five TAs grading um, and the hours we were given and everything and we have all those tutorials, um, the feedback that you get uh, will just be as a class. Um, so you'll have a rubric, though. So the rubric will be graded. And then if you have further questions about how you did, you can ask your TA directly. So they, they'll, they'll have an assessment, um, but they're just not going to be writing comments throughout. Um, again, I apologize for that. It's just I only gave my TAs like five minutes per assignment or 10 minutes for this one. Um, so they have 10 minutes to read it, think about it, assign your rubric, and like make notes of the comments. Um, but again, you're free to, I, I would suggest if you really want feedback, um, more detailed, to talk to them during tutorial and set up a time to see them. So they'll have office hours for that. Um, okay, and so I have a bunch of tips. So the rubric you can see, the rubric's on, online too. Um, again, this is, this, the rubric that I created here, it's very similar to any kind of rubric you would see in sociology. So write clearly have a, a clear argument. I mean, these are all things that seem like, you know, how do I do that? Um, but look at the way arguments are made in the textbook. Um, you know, look at the way that I try to construct arguments in lectures. I always try to make some sort of compelling, important point and justify it with evidence. Um, I may not always do that, but I'm not being evaluated the same way. Um, but, you know, try, make an argument, write clearly, show that you've considered both sides, um, you know, when you're making an argument for why one theory applies better than the other, you know, it's not just, don't just make it some very random reason. Uh, make a case for that reason. Uh, what does that, that theory enable you to see differently? Why is that significant based on the textbook, based on lecture? Um, again, these assignments evolve. Uh, the expectations get higher as the course goes further. And we know you're getting your, this might be your first essay you're writing in university. So all of these things are, are taken into consideration. Um, and, and it is difficult, it's theoretical, and all of those things. Um, but again, we're going to be judging rigor um, and, and effort. Effort, rigor, clarity of writing, all these things that you'll see university courses are trying to gauge. Um, so test number one. We did get our test time. I have to figure out the rooms. Um, so we're in a, I wouldn't say it's a pickle necessarily, but we have, we have uh, three rooms that the test can take place in. Um, so I'm just deciding right now how we divide that. Um, but for sure, everyone in this class will be writing, and you'll be writing, if you have friends in the Tuesday section, you'll be writing at the same time. Um, so Monday, November 5th, um, the time might seem a bit strange. Um, so it, it ends at 6.50. Um, it might be a scheduling error, but on the schedule they gave me, it says it ends at 6.50. So we have to bank on that in case you get kicked out at that time. I don't know, I really don't know what that's going to look like. Um, usually they go up to the hour. Um, but so the, the, the test, um, just as university policy, typically tests when they say they start at like 2 or 3 or 4 or 5. 90% um, of the time they start at 10 after. Um, so unless it's an exam, exams start on the hour. So this class will be no different. The please arrive at 5 p.m. Um, in the classroom that you're told to, to go in. So for in our next class, I'll have the rooms available. Um, it'll either be this room or a room in AA or a room in the science wing. Um, I, th I think it might get divided based on your tutorials. Um, but that, that's all to be determined. I have to talk to Jason about that. Um, so test one for sure is Monday, November 5th. Um, and uh, I will give you lots of guidelines on, on how to study for that. 
Um, OK, so my, my tip again. So for next week, um, it is sad. You know, I've gotten used to being here every Monday. Um, so I'll have a little Socio 3 withdrawal. Um, and hopefully you all will too. But no, you won't, because you'll still be doing the work, just like how I'll still be preparing the lectures. So we'll be with each other in spirit. Um, so for next, oh, that came out darker than I wanted. So you may have a to-do list, nothing, vacation, party, and that's all fine. But I want you to cross that out a little bit of the nothing and stay on top of your courses. So historically, I just know from working with students, the like, one thing you just want to not do is get out of your habit of good reading, good studying, staying on top of things. Um, and I personally found, I mean, I, I'm being hypocritical. I didn't do this in first year. I did this in like second and third year. But once you start you really using reading week and, and the winter holiday, um, in a full year course like this especially, you can really get ahead. Um, so I would recommend, take it easy, you know, do like, even, even if you're only doing like quarter days instead of your full day, whatever that is, um, or working two of the days um, if you don't have any pressing deadlines. Um, but try to, try to get ahead on your courses, because then you can take it a little bit easier the rest of the time. Um, and we all have different study strategies, but um, I would say, again, you just don't want to like party, 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 and then when you come back, it's like, oh my god, school, this is hell. So it's, it's, you don't want vacation withdrawal, right? So oftentimes people need vacations from their vacations. Um, so have fun, be more relaxed, but stay sociological. Um, all right, and then if you have any questions, I'm up here. Otherwise, have an amazing reading week, um, and then I'll see you in two weeks. And you have your tutorials. Essentially oh. what I'm going to be is the day after I get off my flight, I'm here.